Take our Bibles. You're on. You're on. Okay. Turn to Isaiah chapter 60. Yes, he wrote. Isaiah 6 0. Isaiah what, Mike? Yeah. 60-6-0. Yes. As George said, sing as last week. We might uh, do this a few more times before uh, before we're done. Isaiah chapter 60. Starting in verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will, will appear upon you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes round about and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons will come from afar, and your daughters will be carried in the arms. Then you will see and be radiant, and your heart will thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea will be turned to you. The wealth of the nations will come to you. A multitude of camels will cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah and all those from Sheba will come. They will bring gold and frankincense and will bear good news of the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar will be gathered together to you. The rams of Nebaioth will minister to you. They will go up with acceptance on my altar, and I shall glorify my glorious house. Who are these who fly like a cloud and like the doves to their lattices? Surely the coastlands will wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish will come first to bring your sons from afar, their silver and their gold with them, for the name of the Lord your God and for the Holy One of Israel, because he has glorified you. We can stop there. Go ahead and be seated. Matthew chapter 2. As you can see, we have a nice Christmas scene. Uh, with camels and three wise guys and it, it, they're looking down on maybe little town of Bethlehem how still we see thee lie and there's snow on the ground and snow falling and the Christmas star all of these things that uh, may or may not and probably was no snow <laughs> and uh, Jesus was probably born in September, October, uh, at the Feast of Tabernacles, as we talked about last week. And we actually have a, uh, a timeline of Elizabeth's pregnancy, uh, starting with uh, uh, Zechariah's uh, ministry during the, uh, uh, the uh, course of Abijah, uh, which we know was in midsummer. Uh, so we have a pretty good idea of when Jesus was born. But it says, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, so it seems like the, the wise men were late in getting there. It says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. So they arrive in Jerusalem. You know, uh, they think, well, there's, there's a king being born, and uh, uh, Jerusalem is the capital city of Judea, so that's where we will find the king. So they arrived there, and of course they uh, probably are uh, talking to, uh, if not King Herod himself, they're talking to uh, people who take their message to King Herod. But Magi, who are who are Magi? Wise men. Wise men. 
astrologers? Wise, wise men, well, astrologers maybe. Uh, uh, they were probably the scientists of their day. They watched the stars, they watched the constellations, they, uh, they studied nature, they studied human behavior. They were the guys who probably were uh, counselors to the king. King of where? Persia. Probably Persia, the Parthian Empire. And just an interesting uh, historical fact is that the Roman Empire was at that time uh, technically at war. There was an uneasy peace happening uh, <laughs> during this time between the Roman Empire and the Parthian Empire, even though the uh, Parthians had become uh, a part of the Greek Empire, the Romans were never able to conquer Parthia uh, until about the seventh century. Uh, uh, Byzantium, uh, which was the eastern half of the Roman Empire, if you remember your history, uh, had been at war with Parthia for centuries. And in the seventh century, they finally, uh, the, the, the Byzantines were finally able to annex Parthia more or less loosely into their uh, empire, and which didn't really matter because they were both so worn down uh, in uh, men and material that they were easy prey for the Arabs, uh, the, the Muslim Arabs coming out of Arabia. And so all of that area is now Islamic, and that's how that happened, more or less, in a nutshell. They arrived in Jerusalem. Where is he who is born king of the Jews? Now, they had a king, Herod. He was not born king of the Jews. He was a usurper. He was not even really a, a Jew. He was a, a, a descendant of a tribe of uh, uh, Edomites who came into uh, the Negev, the southern desert, and were uh, forced into conversion if they wanted to stay there. And they didn't care. They said, sure, why not? So we have this nice Christmas card scene. Three guys. We have no idea how many there were. There were probably a lot more than three, plus a military escort. Remember, they're going, these are officials of the Parthian Empire. They're going on a mission to a, uh, to a hostile state. Jerusalem was part of the Roman Empire at this, at this point. So th there was likely a uh, hundred or more. And whether they rode on camels, I have no idea. Um, makes nice Christmas cards, though. <laughs> Three guys on camels. But who are these guys called magi? Well, we, we have a, another spot in the Bible we can go to where it mentions magi, or magoi in Greek, uh, in Daniel chapter 2. Verse 2, you remember Nebuchadnezzar had a dream uh, and he was very disturbed about it. He says, uh, then the king, that's Nebuchadnezzar, gave orders to call in the magicians, that's the Magoi, the conjurers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. Uh, and remember the story that uh, all of these guys could not uh, first of all, Nebuchadnezzar says, I'm not going to tell you the dream. You've got to tell me the dream. If you are who you say you are, you should have no trouble at all telling me what my dream was. And they said, well, you tell us the dream and we'll interpret it. He says, no, you tell me the dream or I'm going to behead you or impale you or whatever he had in store for them. But as we follow along in the story, uh, Daniel is able to tell the king his dream and interpret it. And uh, Daniel uh, rises within the uh, Babylonian Empire to be the chief of the Magoi. Uh, and then his reputation precedes him, and he also has a prominent 
position in that respect uh, within the following Medo-Persian Empire because the, the uh, Babylonian Empire was basically lasted the lifetime of uh, Nebuchadnezzar and, and a few more years after that. But that was it. It's possible, you know, I mean, where was Daniel when he was the chief of the Magoi in uh, the, uh, Babel, or the Persian Empire? He's probably in Sushan, the capital of Persian Empire. Uh, he probably, you know, instructed some uh, young guys and possibly gave them uh, additional prophecies than what we have written down in the Bible. Hey, you know, there's a, a Messiah coming, uh, and, and you can watch for this star, this particular star. You noticed, uh, they said, we saw his star in the east, and then they went west. That's just an interesting little thing. We saw his star in the east, and they went west. So it wasn't just that there was a star, and they said, oh, let's go over where that star is. Uh, they had additional instructions. They knew this star, this particular star, meant something. And there's all kinds of speculation that, that uh, this star might have been a supernova or this star might have been a conjunction of stars or planets or something or other. But the reality is it was something uh, supernatural. We can see that a little later. We do have a prophecy uh, way back when the Israelites were wandering in the desert. Uh, uh, what was the prophet's name? Oh, Balaam. He says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob. A scepter shall rise from Israel and shall crush through the forehead of Moab and tear down all the sons of Sheth. Sheth is just a Hebrew word that means uh, uh, chaos, sons of chaos. Interesting though that uh, Matthew does not refer to that prophecy. So we can kind of take that one with a grain of salt. But back in Genesis, 114 says, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven. You know, we don't know what that word firmament means. It sounds to us like something firm, right? <clears throat> but that's probably not what it means, but we really don't. You know, the, the closest we can <clears throat> figure is it means something stretched out, something thin. Anyway, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven. <clears throat> to give light upon the earth, to divide between day and night, and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days, and for years. So there is uh, some uh, biblical uh, support for the idea that there are signs in the heavens. Psalm 19 says, uh, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims the work of his hands. The stretched out thinness, the firmness, firmament. Day to day utters speech, and night to night proclaims knowledge. There are no speeches or languages in which their voices are not heard. Their voice is gone out into all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. So, there's possible speculation that there was some form of astrology uh, that proclaimed uh, the word of God back, way back when. That's not to uh, uh, give any credence to the modern idea of astrology as a, a form of, uh, of uh, foretelling. foretelling the future or anything like that. Uh, but there may have been a revelation uh, based upon uh, signs in the stars. And we even see in the book of Revelation 
uh, a wondrous sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, uh, uh, and the moon under her feet. I mean, this is something in the sky. Whether we're going to get to see that at some point or not, I don't know. But anyway, back to Matthew. It says uh, in uh, verse 3, When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Oh no, what do we got here? We have a claimant to the throne. Uh, does this mean we're going to war? So um, why do you think all Jerusalem was troubled with him? Well, because whatever affected uh, Herod had a tendency to affect, affect uh, the people, uh, mostly adversely. Herod was not a nice guy. Uh, but that when a usurper hears that there is a rightful king coming, he's going to be troubled. Uh, his underlings are going to be troubled. And they're going to cause trouble for you know, people under them. Uh, Herod was not a rightful king. He was not of the line of David. He, he was uh, not even a descendant of Jacob. Uh, uh, Herod's throne was in jeopardy if there was a rightful king. Uh, he called all the, the Jewish scholars together and inquired uh, of them, where is the Christ going to be born? Now that's interesting. They didn't say anything about the Christ, but the Magi, they didn't ask him about that. We said there was he came to see one born king of the Jews. It was Herod that made that connection. He was more, uh, he knew more about the scriptures than he was letting on. He knew that the coming king was going to be the Messiah. And it says in verse 4, gathering together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. We'll see that formula. This was written by the prophet. This was uh, done in order to fulfill what was written by the prophet, etc. We'll see this quite a bit in the Gospel of Matthew, because Matthew was written uh, for a Jewish audience to present to them their Messiah. Now this is a straightforward, a fairly straightforward prophecy that uh, the Messiah was going to be born in the city of Bethlehem of Judea. There is another Bethlehem up north and it distinguishes between the two. Uh, this is what's written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Matthew contracts it just a little bit. Here's what Micah actually wrote, at least uh, from the translation of the Masoretic text. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. The Messiah is eternal. He's not a created uh, being, as some would have us believe. He goes on. See, see, whenever you see an Old Testament quotation in the New Testament, you should look at the, look back at the whole thing. Because usually the readers were well informed and they knew the scriptures. If you said one thing, you know, you gave one verse, they, they would know the whole passage. But Micah goes on and says, Therefore he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor has borne a child. Then the remainder or remnant of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel. 
And he will arise and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God. And they will remain because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. Now, I think that there is some mixture of, of the prophecy regarding Jesus' first coming and his second coming in here, which is not uncommon. And when he returns to establish his kingdom, we will be able to see some of these things a little more clearly. You know, what was a first coming prophecy? What is a second coming prophecy? But Matthew is clearly trying to establish in uh, his readers the idea of a, of a Jewish king, the Jewish Messiah. Of course, modern Jews are mostly not concerned with a Messiah much at all. I mean, very few of them. Some are, or they'll give a lip service. Yeah, there's a Messiah coming. Who knows? Maybe he came and we missed it, which is actually the case. But then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. Now, of course, you know, from the time they saw the star and they had, you know, meetings and discussions about what it all meant and figured it all out. Uh, and. Uh, you know, made all the arrangements and, you know, got the caterer involved uh, and the uh, transportation manager and the logistics guy and got it all together. Was took quite a while to, to get this. Uh, I, I think I read that the, the best you could do, just starting out uh, on a camel or a horse uh, from Shushan to Jerusalem is going to be at least 40 days. I mean, if you travel hard. But Herod wanted to know the exact time, and he has a purpose in that. It says, And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. But we know that Herod is planning treachery. It says that after hearing the king, they went their way, and the star, which they had seen in the east, went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. Well, you know, they saw a star in the east, they went west, but then all of a sudden the same star, how they recognized it, I don't know. But then the, this is the part from, from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, they followed the star. Now, Jerusalem to Bethlehem is five miles. I mean, you can walk that in a couple of hours, especially since it's pretty good downhill down to Bethlehem. There have been all kinds of, as I said before, astronomical uh, or attempts at astro astronomical uh, explanation of what uh, might have been this star, but right here they all fail because stars don't, you know, come down and, uh, you know, lead groups of people to a particular place and then stand right over it. So what we're probably looking at was the Shekinah glory, God's special light, which manifested to the children of Israel leaving Egypt as the cloud by day, the fire by night. It stood over the place where the child was, and when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Whatever it was, it stood out from all the other stars, all the other lights in the firmament of heaven. And it says, after coming into the house, wait a second, what happened to the stable and the manger? Well, remember, uh, Herod wanted to know exactly when they saw the star. It's been a little while. Uh, so our scenes with the uh, shepherds and the angels and the, and the magi with their camels showing up all at the same time are not accurate. As we'll see, it was probably two years since that happened. 
and Mary and Joseph are established in a house. Uh, they likely had relatives that, you know, they were of the house of David, and Luke tells us they went to uh, Bethlehem uh, to pay the tax, property tax, on the family land holdings in a, or around Bethlehem. But after coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. As I was reading this, I was thinking, you know, this may be a prophecy right here. A lot of times, prophecy comes in the form of illusion. You know, it's kind of like this. Remember back in Isaiah 60, you know, they that all these wonderful things were being brought into the land. Uh, you know, arise and shine for your light has come. What, what is going to cause that scenario to happen? Oh, the second coming of their king. This is a down payment against the future, in essence. But it says, having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Now, some critics said, well, how come Herod didn't send uh, representatives with the Magi to find out where this was? Well, maybe he did. You know, maybe they, uh, you know, got up in the middle of the night and left the Herod's representatives uh, sleeping, sleeping in their tents. So they snuck off. I don't know. And of course, Herod finds out somehow, so they hoof it back to Jerusalem and tell him. But it says, uh, Now when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. And he remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what has been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Now, I'm going to read the whole thing from Hosea. It says, When Israel was a youth, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. The more they called him, the more they went from, from them. They kept sacrificing to the Baals, and burning incense to idols. Yes, it is I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of a man, with bonds of love, and I became to them as one who lifts the yoke from their jaws and bent down and fed them. And I think really what Matthew is pointing out here is that this child, the Messiah, born uh, in Bethlehem, is the same one who had uh, been kind to Israel uh, and was going to continue this kindness. Once again, prophecy is not always, you know, thus says the Lord and here's where it happens. It's, it's more complex than that. But when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. So when he asked them, when did you first see the star? Well, it was two years ago. So he goes to Bethlehem, all the children that were born two years before and since uh, are, are killed. Now we have no other record of this. And Josephus writes quite a bit about uh, Herod's uh, crimes. Uh, and yet he doesn't record this. That's probably not all that important because Bethlehem is more or less an insignificant town with probably a very small population. Uh, we might be talking about four or five or six or less than ten. 
I'm sure. So, in the scheme of things, it's uh, in comparison to the other things that uh, uh, that uh, Herod had done. It was pretty small on the list. Um, Herod killed some of his own sons and their mothers. He had, you know, multiple wives uh, because he felt he thought that they were plotting against him. And they probably were. Uh, so he had them killed. Uh, uh, Emperor Augustus, who you know knew Herod quite well, uh, I think they went to school in Rome together. But he said uh, at one point he said uh, it is better to be Herod's sow than Herod's son. Uh, for the sow had a better chance of surviving in a Jewish community. You know, you don't kill pigs to eat them. Um, he was uh, making a pun, actually, because in Greek, sow is kuos and son is huios. You know, similar, similar words. But Matthew then ties this to another prophecy. He says, then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet, was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. Well, if we go to Jeremiah, we see that this uh, lamentation is due to the fact that the sons of uh, Israel and Judah were being taken off into captivity by the Babylonians. Jeremiah says, Thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter, bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Thus says the Lord, Restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work will be rewarded, declares the Lord, and they will return from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your future, declares the Lord and your children will return to their own country. I have surely heard Ephraim grieving. You have chastised me, and I was chastised like an untrained calf. Bring me back that I may be restored, for you are the Lord my God. The idea here is even though the sons of Judah and Israel are being taken away into captivity, that God still has a plan. God is, is still watching out for them. Even though this tragedy has happened, God is going to bring goodness uh, even through this evil. Once again, this is, this is kind of how prophecy works. You have to not just look at, well, here's what it says, and here's how it plays out. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. Came back from Egypt. I've often mentioned a few times that I really believe that the ministry of Jesus was something more like six years. Even though we only have about 85 days of his life uh, recorded in the Bible, his ministry was probably more than the three years that we ascribe to it. Because if we look at the timeline of when he was born, we know that historically that Herod the Great died in 4 BC and then he had the children killed uh, from two years before so that puts Jesus at least at 6 BC maybe there was even a year before Herod died in there so that would go back to 7 BC and then we see uh, it's, it's uh, typically uh, understood that the crucifixion year was 32 AD so we take 32 and add 
six to it, that makes it 38. So Jesus died at the age of 38. And Luke tells us that he began his ministry uh, approximately at the age of 30 years old. So his ministry could have been as much as eight years. So, for anybody who cares, it doesn't matter. None of that really matters. But it says that when Joseph heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Archelaus was crazier than his father. Uh, historians believe that he had some kind of mental disorder. Uh, he was uh, more brutal than his father, but his uh, time was short-lived. He, uh, he was uh, king for 10 years, then he died. Uh, and after being warned by God in a dream, Joseph left for the regions of Galilee. And he came and lived in a city called Nazareth. Now we uh, seem to get from the other Gospels that Jesus, that Mary and Joseph probably came from Nazareth originally, or at least that area. Nazareth today is a pretty large city. What is it, about 100,000, 200,000, something like that? And they have Christmas decorations up year-round. <laughs> Which is kind of interesting. Breaking in the box. What's that? Breaking in the box. Yeah. Uh, and most of the signs are in Russian, or else Arabic. In Russian? Russian, yeah. Uh, most of the Jews that have settled in Nazareth uh, recently are Russians. Oh my gosh. So. Yeah. They came and lived in a city called Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Now this one stumps all kinds of folks. Um, Nowhere, anywhere in the Bible does it say anything like he shall be called a Nazarene. And some people have speculated that it uh, has to do with a Hebrew word uh, that is similar to Nazarene, uh, Nazar, which means branch. That seems kind of like a stretch. But Nazareth, remember what uh, uh, Nathaniel said when uh, Peter uh, said, uh, we found the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth? Can anything good, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And that, that kind of gives you the thought uh, that people from Nazareth were despised. They were considered of low account. Isaiah 53, 3 says he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. It seems that's probably more likely the, uh, the understanding that we're to have, and the, probably the understanding that Luke, uh, I'm sorry, Matthew's audience would have, but we can't be sure. It's difficult. But the Magi made a uh, error that probably anybody would probably make. You know, they saw in the stars. How they saw that, I don't know. But they saw in the stars that a king of the Jews was had been born. And so where'd they go? They go to Jerusalem. They go to the palace. I've been to uh, Herod's palace in Jerusalem. It's uh, an archaeological site right now. You have to go down uh, uh, in a hole in the ground and uh, get down into it. The, uh, the workmanship of, of the rooms and the furnishings and everything, the tile is just amazing. Um, but it's all in ruins. We went to his other palace at Masada, same thing, amazing workmanship. Herod's palace is kind of hanging down off the side of the cliff. Uh, it's actually, you know, you've got to use handholds to get down in there, but 
once again, he's got bathhouses and, uh, you know, ornate uh, bedrooms. And it's just amazing. But it's all in ruins. So, where is the Messiah to come? Clearly not the palace. Uh, you know, the scribes and the priests, you know, the political operatives of the day, well, they knew he was going to be born in Bethlehem, but, you know, we really didn't expect him today. You know, is there, is there any place within the uh, uh, institutions of government, whether then or now or any time in between, for the Messiah to come? Uh, not likely. There, there's, there's a few believing folks that would welcome their Messiah, but mostly not. Uh, you know, we're, we're so uh, involved in our uh, political aspirations and programs and dugidisms that, uh, you know, we don't have time for a Messiah. Unless he comes in a flying saucer, and we would accept a flying saucer Messiah, right? I mean, they're actually looking for him. They actually uh, have a program called uh, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, and I've actually read things by some folks that say we're, you know, we are looking for a race of superior beings to save us. Larry. Um, it's interesting, this is probably satanic in nature, uh, but there's a lot of UFO stuff that's being pre presented all over the place now, I mean everywhere. Yeah. And uh, it's being, being documented. Uh, yeah. Being well, we, by the government. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Better to But in John, we read, the Messiah came. He came to his own, and his own rejected him. So John goes on and says, to those who receive him, he gives the power to become the children of God. Uh, there's a there's an old saying that says if you go to Jerusalem don't expect to find a king there unless you bring him with you let's pray Lord we're just thankful that uh, you have come and you have come in uh, response to uh, uh, the prophecy the expectation uh, that was given to your holy prophets just thank you, Lord, that uh, those prophets can be read and understood, uh, and they give details about who you are and what you are to do. And Lord, we are thankful that uh, you have given us this power to become your children, your brothers. Uh, you became like us in order that uh, you might make us like yourself. We pray, Lord, that... Uh, the road you have us on, that you would, uh, you would keep us on it uh, until you're coming. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.